questions without notice. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Madam, uh, my question is directed uh, to the Prime Minister. Uh, if, as the uh, Treasurer has stated, and I quote, every cent of the Commonwealth's $9 billion surplus will be used to pay back debt, end of quote, how does the Prime Minister propose to fund the tax cuts in the wage tax trade-off package he foreshadowed last week? The Honourable Prime Minister. Uh, I find the uh, question almost incomprehensible. The fact is... Uh, Order. Hi. Uh, Madam uh, Speaker, the uh, simple facts are that uh, as far as uh, the uh, government is concerned, we have taken the decision to create uh, a surplus of $9.1 billion and uh, that will enable us, as we have said in April when we made the announcement, uh, to, uh, to fund the uh, tax cuts and still retain the uh, thrust of the budget to uh, take out of the uh, spending capacity of the community that amount of money. Uh, there is no question at all of the technical capacity of the Commonwealth to do it. The Honourable Member for Brand. I direct my question to the Minister for Social Security. Is the Minister aware of claims that the government's retire retirement income policy announced last night does nothing for women. Given that the current labour force participation rate of women has reached historically high levels, could the minister explain how the measures contained in the government's retirement income policy will be of benefit to women in the workforce? The Honourable Minister for Social Security. Uh, I thank the Honourable Member for Brand uh, for her question. Of course, it is uh, totally false to claim that uh, the retirement income policy neglects uh, women workers. In fact, their concerns are placed at the centre of our comprehensive and integrated retirement income policy. The measures developed by the government will significantly increase women's superannuation coverage, implement arrangements that are more responsive to women's employment patterns and improve the level of their superannuation benefits. Award-based superannuation initiated by the government and the ACTU has extended superannuation to many women for the first time ever. The government is committed to the further extension of award-based superannuation and will consider the gradual introduction of the further 3 per cent. The government will also change access to tax-assisted personal superannuation to better reflect women's employment patterns. Women working as little as 10 hours a week are outside the paid workforce for up to two years will be granted access to tax-assisted superannuation from next July. Changes to superannuation reasonable benefit limits will also particularly assist women. These changes will allow funds to substantially increase reversionary benefits to widows and will base limits for tax-assisted benefits on a worker's highest average salary in any three consecutive years rather than their final three years of employment. Award-based superannuation provides for full vesting and preservation to age 55 or later retirement. Many old schemes operating before the 86 reforms have inadequate vesting and preservation arrangements. This particularly disadvantages women who stay for short periods with an employer who will leave and later re-enter the workforce. These measures fully implement, and I repeat, fully implement the government's commitments to the national agenda for women on retirement income matters. The age pension will remain for those who have not had adequate opportunities to save for retirement. And of course, as we know, 70 per cent uh, of uh, people dependent on the age pension are women, and the government has made a commitment to not only exceed uh, 25 per cent of average weekly earnings, but also to, uh, uh, as uh, condition permit, to provide for further increases. Women can also be confident the government will monitor the progress of women's participation in superannuation and labour market opportunities, particularly during the period from 1995 when improved vesting and preservation standards apply before giving consideration to an increase in the age pension or service pension age for women. Uh, order. I inform the House that we have present in the gallery the Right Honourable Lord Mackay of Clashburn, the United Kingdom Lord Chancellor. On behalf of the House, I extend a very warm welcome to our visitor. Yeah. The Honourable Member for Wentworth. Thank you, Madam Speaker. My question is to the Treasurer. What is the projected ratio of net foreign debt to GDP by the end of this financial year? 
The Honourable the Treasurer. Uh, as a speaker off the top of my head, I couldn't recall what number we have in. Well, you can do. Order. You, you can, Order. You can do the sums yourself with a calculator. Just work out what you think GDP is out of the papers. Because I'm not Member here to, for I'm not to answer your puny questions by doing research for him. The Honourable Member for Philip. My question is for the Minister for Community Services and Health. Will the Minister inform, inform honourable members whether the government has taken steps to ensure that childcare remains within the reach of low-income families? Yeah. The Honourable Minister for Health. Madam Speaker, I thank, thank the Honourable Member for Philip for her question and uh, would like to take the opportunity of saying that of course, she has been one of the members within the government who has done much to develop the policy of childcare within the government ranks. The theme of uh, equity and affordability are central to the changes that have been made in the budget as relates to childcare this year. And of course, as all members know, because they've experienced it in their own electorates, this government has presided over a massive expansion of publicly funded childcare. We have more than doubled the number of places in our years in government from 46,000 when we came to office to 114,000 places today, and we are committed to another 30,000 places over the next three years, and 8,200 of those will be in place by the end of this financial year, and the budget provides for those extra financial places. In addition, this year's budget has concentrated on ensuring that childcare remains affordable to lower income families. Honourable members will recall that it was this government which introduced fee relief for families in childcare centres, designed, of course, to benefit lower income families, and we did that in 1984. Now, for the first time, this budget announces that the government intends to index this fee annually so that the fee relief payments will uh, be adjusted from now on each year. The fee relief ceilings for government-funded childcare centres and family daycare centres will rise to $92.50 for the long-day centres and to $68 for family daycare schemes. We've also, again with the same point in mind, to make the system as equitable as possible, we've decided to increase the threshold income at which users start to pay more than minimum fees from $255 gross to $280 per week gross. And these initiatives will mean a rise of uh, $7 per week per child in government assistance to families receiving that relief, and that will be adjusted each year in line with inflation. In addition, the budget also provides operational increases in operational subsidies for all kinds of government-funded childcare, includes occasional care, centres, family day care schemes and long day centres, and they will also be adjusted this year by inflation. Further, the government has proposed a new and for the first time a fee relief scheme to assist lower income families making use of outside school hours care, and we are approaching the states to cost share this uh, fee relief scheme in outside school hours care. And I believe that uh, these measures acknowledge the crucial role of childcare, not only in our social policies, but in our economic policies, and will extend the affordability of childcare to families in this country. The Honourable Member for Wentworth. Thank you, Madam Speaker. My questions are going to the Treasurer. What is the revenue effect of bracket creep for the 1989-90 financial year? The Honourable Treasurer. Uh, no, Madam Speaker, there's in, there just seems to be a total misunderstanding of the budget concept this year on the part of the opposition, because the leader of the opposition asked a question earlier about the, about the tax cuts. The tax cuts are funded in this year's budget. The budget wouldn't be $9.1 in surplus, it would be $14.6 billion were it not for the tax cuts. So, so, this, so then I get a question from the shadow treasurer, what he thinks fiscal, fiscal drag is, is the expression like he used, will be bracket creep, bracket creep over the course of the year when we've got a very large, when we've got a very large, the largest indeed, tax cut in our history Member being Frank funded Connor from this year. Injecting. So, uh, so Madam Speaker, I, uh, I, where the balance of uh, collections 
versus the tax cuts finally lie, I'm not certain. But there's uh, quite a uh, there's quite a uh, there's quite a clear commentary in the uh, in statement two about uh, some of these points. And uh, the mo but the main the main point the main point is that of course the tax share in GDP this year will be the same year as when the last government was in office. That is, in the last two years of the budgets of the Fraser government, the revenue share in GDP was 26.2 per cent, the same as it is in forecast for this year. But instead then of a budget deficit of $9 billion plus, which was bequeathed to this government, you've got a surplus of $9 billion. You've got a surplus of over 2 per cent of GDP on the same revenue share which you had when you were last in office. So, I mean, how's that grab you? <laughs> The Honourable Member for Ballarat. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I direct, I direct my question without notice to the Minister of Prime Minister for Resources, and I ask, in view of the significance of the Australian live sheep trade to Saudi Arabia, worth $130 million per year, and I know my farms in Ballarat are very concerned about this, can the Minister advise what steps the government has taken to clarify quarantine issues raised by the Saudi Arabian government in recent weeks? And can the Minister further advise whether any additional evidence as to the disease status of recent live sheep shipments has come to light. The Honourable Minister for Primary Industry and Energy. Good day. Uh, Madam Speaker, I thank the Honourable Member for his question and his ongoing interest in this issue. Uh, members in the House may be interested to note, I think that's he's asked me four times as many questions this year as the Shadow Minister, Shadow Spokesman for Primary Industry. Uh, as members would be aware, no, 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 he's chewed in. No. As members would be aware, as members would be aware, three shipments of live sheep to Saudi Arabia uh, have been rejected by the Saudi authorities in recent weeks on the contention that blue tongue and sheep pox were present in some sheep. I should stress that Australian authorities have been given no evidence that the sheep were in fact infected, and having regard to Australia's internationally accepted animal health status, we've not accepted the Saudi review. However, there is a clear need to ensure that the live sheep trade with Saudi Arabia is conducted on a stable and transparent basis, and to that end the government has been in close contact with the Saudi Arabian ministers and the Saudi Arabian ambassador in Canberra. I have announced today that a high-level delegation to be headed by Dr Gardner Murray, an ex executive director of my department, will shortly be leaving for Riyadh to hold discussions with the Saudi Arabian authorities. I should emphasise that the government's concern to ensure that an agreed means of handling any concerns which the Saudi Arabians may have about Australia's sheep disease status and future be established. Uh, the decision to send such a high-level delegation to Saudi Arabia is supported by Australian sheep producers and export industry groups, which met with my department, the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade in Sydney yesterday. And I would like to also assure the House, Madam Speaker, that the government is closely monitoring this issue. The Honourable Leader of the National Party. Thank you, Madam Speaker. My question is to the Prime Minister. In the light of Simon Crean's comment that the budget doesn't contain a trading strategy and today's current account deficit of over $1.7 billion for July, when will the government remove impediments to export growth, such as its illogical three mines policy for uranium, the floor price on uranium and the coal export levy? The Honourable Prime Minister. Well, Madam Speaker, it's very interesting this question coming from the uh, Leader of the uh, National Party as to the existence or absence of strategies because he delivered himself of a remarkable observation this morning when he was coming to Parliament House. I don't know whether he was covering, recovering from a late night or whether there's any other reasonably innocuous explanation for what he said. But the question was this, uh, when would you like to see the opposition's policies released? Blunt? Well, we've released nearly 30 policies. Question. Economic policies. Answer from Blunt. Well, when the Prime Minister tells us when the election is, then we'll tell you when we're going to release our policies. <laughs> <laughs> and this man, this man has the temerity to get up in this place and ask about the existence or non-existence of our policies. He's telling the Australian people that the opposition will not release their economic policies until the Prime Minister announces the election date. <laughs> Have you ever heard anything more politically irresponsible? Now, I, wonder, I wonder whether, in fact, that is the position of the Leader of the Opposition. Because it's not what the Leader of the Opposition has been saying, and it's not what the Shadow Treasurer has been saying. 
We were getting different statements coming from them. Well, it was going to be in April of this year, then it was going to be in June, then it was going to be in August. Then it Prime Minister resume his seat. The Honourable Member for O'Connor has a The point, point of order. order, Madam Speaker, is section 145 relevance. The question put to the Prime Minister is of a great national importance, and the Prime Minister wants to do the only thing he's good at and order. tell a couple the of jokes. Order. The as member he has sees put it. his point Not of order. Funny. The Prime Minister will now answer the question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, the answer. <laughs> I was just giving a, a nice introduction to the answer, Madam Speaker. Very very relevant intro Order. introduction. Now, Madam Speaker, what I gently said to my good friend and uh, soon-to-be colleague on this side of the House after the next election, whenever I announce it, I was saying to her last night that Simon hadn't quite got it right. Now, that, that's the case. Uh, we, we can have circumstances where otherwise very erudite, learned, uh, well-informed people can get it slightly wrong. And my good friend Simon Crean, the president of the ACTU, got it slightly wrong. Because, in fact, the strategy of the government is quite clear, uh, both in regard to uh, the question of inflation that he was particularly talking about and in regard to lowering the current account. Now, this is a year in which, in particular, as my friend the Treasurer has had cause to say, that you look not only at year-on-year uh, -year average, but it's very important in the financial year 1989-90 to be looking at what's happening through the course of the year. And in regard to inflation, as I pointed out in commenting upon Simon Crean's observation, we expect that through the course of the year inflation will be trending down. Why do we say that? We can identify three specific reasons, of course, why that will be the case. Firstly, there will be, as we've pointed out, an easing and a significant easing of demand pressures associated with the strategy of the budget. And may I say, in regard to the strategy of the budget, and uh, the reaction to the budget. Let me make the observation, Madam Speaker, that in the less than 24 hours that have transpired since the Treasurer delivered the budget, two things have become clear. Two things. One, it, one is, the, uh, uh, is the responsibility and the honesty of the budget, and the second thing that has emerged is the pathetic irrelevancy of the opposition. The reaction is best summed up, Madam Speaker, by what was said on AM this morning by a spokesman for Shearson, Lehman and Hutton, uh, the, uh, the United States uh, firm. And the spokesperson, the spokesperson... Order. Order. The House and, will come to order. And the, spo and the spokesperson... Member for Bruce. And the spokesperson for Shearson, Lehman and Hutton, one Lisa Sinstrom, is a remarkably perspicacious person. Because what did Lisa... Sinstrom have to say, Madam Speaker. She said the budget, the budget, she said, is surprisingly honest given that it's the last one before the next election. And I quote Lisa Sinstrom, very perspicacious person. She said he, the Treasurer, is not trying to make things look any, you know, sort of better than they actually are. So I think that that should give them some credibility. And then she delivered this obviously uh, a delectable uh, aside. And to be fair, they really don't have too much in the way of opposition anyway. The Honourable Prime Minister resume his seat. The Honourable Prime Minister finished his answer. No, I resume his seat, please. The Honourable Member for O'Connor well, has well, a point Madam of order. Madam Speaker, you have just complained. My point of order is relevance again. You've just complained about noise on this side, yet you're <laughs> tolerating the Prime Minister doing anything but telling us about their policy on three mines order. uranium and uh, The those Prime other Minister questions. is answering the question. The Prime Minister. Madam Speaker, as I was uh, saying, uh, just by way of that uh, slight aside, to put it in the context, on the two questions that Simon Crean talked about, that is inflation and, uh, and the current account situation, I was saying that in regard to the inflation situation, we expect the through the year situation to improve. And I said that that would be for three reasons. The first I'd gone to, and that is the easing of demand. Secondly, of course, in the area that did uh, involve some uh, increased impetus to price movements, the, uh, resulting from the increase in the price of vegetables uh, with the floods in New South Wales. That will, if I can say so, wash out of the system uh, in, uh, in this year. And thirdly, of course, there will be a decline, we believe, in house prices and by the end of the year a decline in mortgage interest rates. So there is a strategy, there is in operation a number of factors which will involve a through the year decline in the rate of inflation. Now, as far as the current account situation 
is concerned, Madam Speaker. I think it's instructive if we uh, look at some of the figures that are contained uh, in the uh, papers associated with the budget, because that will give an indication, Madam Speaker, of just uh, what we expect to be happening during the year on this matter. Now, if you look at the question of, uh, of, of imports, Madam Speaker, we had a situation in uh, 1989 uh, uh, in which there was a 25 per cent. Now, we're coming to. Can the Honourable to... Prime Minister resume his seat. Oh. The Honourable Leader of the National Party. He tells me he's coming to it, so it's Christmas. Madam Speaker, I asked a question which related to two aspects of the uranium. Order. The Honourable Prime Minister is answering what the question. What the price of vegetables has got to do with The Honourable Member vegetables. resume his seat. To that point of order, Madam Speaker, on the question of relevance, the honourable, ge the honourable gentleman's question referred not order. just to the question of uranium. The honourable member was speaking down. to the point of order. The honourable gentleman's question referred not just to the question of uranium. He included in his, his preamble a discussion of what uh, Simon Crean had had to say, and he also asked a question related to the overall trading policy That's of the right. government. I would say that this is manifestly relevant, and the repeated interjections by the other side in the forms of point of order are in fact disorderly. The Honourable Here. Prime Minister. Now, Madam Speaker, as I was saying, in uh, directly answering the question, we had a situation in. The Honourable, Honourable Prime Minister resume his seat. The, the Honourable Member for Farrah. The Minister for Defence in his concluding remarks reflected on you, the Chair. You gave no ruling in respect of those comments of the Minister for Defence. I ask, is there a ruling in respect of that further comment by the, the Minister Prime for Defence? The Prime Minister is answering the question, as I have said three times before. The Prime Minister Same. is entitled to in, answer uh, the question in his own way. In 1988-89, uh, Madam Speaker, uh, we had a 25 per cent increase in imports. Now, what is projected for 8990 is a 3 per cent increase. In terms of exports, Madam Speaker, a 1 per cent increase, a projected 7.5 per cent increase. Now, Madam Speaker, that's going to involve a massive turnaround in the net export situation, which is intrinsically involved in what the Simon Crean was talking about and what the honourable gentleman has addressed his question to. We're going to have a turnaround, Madam Speaker, of over five percentage points. Because net exports in 1980-89 uh, contributed a minus 4.4 per cent, and in 1989-90 they are expected to contribute three quarters of a percent positive. So that's a turnaround of over five per cent, and that will be consistent, Madam Speaker, uh, with what uh, the Treasurer and I have been talking about, and that is that we have been making the decisions in this country in a whole range of areas, including the mining industry, which have involved investment, which are now bringing into place projects which will have income and export streams starting this year and going on into the future. And specifically, if you want to talk about uranium, I have nothing more to say on that point than I've made before, that the policy, that the policy of this government has been properly arrived at. We have a three-mine policy, and under that policy, uh, the situation is that the existing producers are having difficulty getting adequate prices for their existing production. We are, in fact, Madam Speaker, as you know, conducting inquiry within the processes of the Labor Party in regard to the overall uranium policy. I'm not going to preempt the finding of that, but I say in regard to the present situation, it would be manifestly absurd to suggest that to have any more uranium mines in, the, in this country would add to the export potential of Australia. The Honourable Member for Bendigo. Thank you, Madam Speaker. My question is directed to the uh, Minister for Social Security. The Treasurer last night announced a major restructuring of the interaction of the social security system, uh, income test and taxation for aged pensioners. Can the Minister for Social Security inform the House of the basis of this reform, which will be achieved by 1995, and explain how it will improve retirement incomes for older Australians? The Honourable Minister for Social Security. Uh, Madam Speaker, uh, I thank uh, the Honourable Member for Bendigo for his question. I think the difference uh, in some respects between the, uh, the government and the opposition on this issue is that we are interested uh, more than uh, in a question of attitude towards uh, uh, aged pensioners or towards reform, but actually spelling out uh, in a very clear-cut and fundamental way what reform will mean in areas that uh, are understood to be crucial, not only uh, in terms of the work done by those responsible for reviewing the social security system, but also seen by people at the grassroots as being important issues for aged pensioners today. 
Uh, Madam Speaker, we've approached the uh, question of reform in terms of uh, the relationship between the income test uh, and uh, tracks treatment of income in terms of stages. We announced uh, in April of this year the first uh, an extremely important stage where for all full rate uh, pensioners the income test free area, $40 for single pensioners and $70 for married pensioners, uh, will become tax free uh, by July of next year. That is, for the first time, historically, uh, we ensure that there is uh, identity of treatment for full rate pensioners uh, so that all full rate pensioners will no longer pay tax uh, when that reform is completed uh, in July of next year. Now, we indicated uh, in the Treasurer's statement a second stage in relation to that reform. That is that the government will lock in the reform in terms of indexation. It will ensure from uh, July 1991 that uh, from henceforth there is no question of full rate pensioners paying tax and the value of that free area uh, is to be maintained in real terms. An extraordinarily important reform, not a question of attitude, not a question of saying somehow we'll improve things, but a specific reform which locks in the change announced in April this year, which I think gave pensioners a sense of credibility in terms of this whole process. Then thirdly, the government is saying, and we've made it very clear, that this business of reform won't be all over in a day or two, a month or two or a year or two. It's a reform to be carried out over a period of time, and it is, of course, not costless in terms of, uh, of that bringing that change about. And so we've said from July 1995, we'll ensure that all pensioners are removed altogether from the taxation system. That is, that we achieve in terms of simplicity what has never been achieved before, and we ensure that uh, in terms of any withdrawal rate, which effectively will, will be via Social Security, that we do not exceed uh, 50 cents in the dollar. That is, that the, the, the problem of effective marginal tax rates, often bleated about by the opposition, is resolved by this government. And what do we get from the, uh, from the opposition at this point in time? We get the kind of griping, uh, criticism about, uh, about having thought of it. Having thought of it. I mean, there was nothing in terms of what the opposition put out by way of a policy statement that went clearly to the mechanism that might be employed to achieve a solution to the problem of high effective marginal tax rates and a way of achieving uh, the kind of positive incentive for retirement income savings, which would enable over time a fundamental change in retirement income policy so that we get the right balance, on the one hand, between the government pension and uh, the, uh, the question of annuities or superannuation, uh, on the other hand, a proper balance in terms of retirement income, which means that this government, more than any predecessor, has shown it can deal with the issue, central issue of the fact that the population is ageing, as many people will, become, uh, uh, will be over 65 in the next 40 years has uh, moved into that group in the last 80 years. All of that additional cost can be sensibly resolved by a mechanism which uh, both simplifies, makes more equitable and provides a positive long-term direction. That, Madam Speaker, is solid policy. What we've heard from the opposition is emotional claptrap. The honourable member for Wentworth. Thank you, Madam Speaker. My question is to the Treasurer. The Order. July balance of payments figures suggest that the economy is still growing strongly. If economic growth in the September quarter is about 1 per cent, is it a fact that the budget growth forecasts imply no further growth in the remaining three quarters of this financial year? The Honourable Treasurer. Madam Speaker, the Shadow Treasurer was, was uh, uh, banging this drum last night. Let me just uh, straighten him up on, uh, on what it means. He's talking about a recession. Now he ought to know he was he he and he and his former former treasurer were the recession specialists. <laughs> they gave us the first negative growth in 30 years in 1982-3. And as I've said in this house on a number of occasions, it takes an extra special talent to actually make an economy contract. But but that's what you managed to do. Well, you were in office, you're around the corridors, you're around giving the advice, and what we saw was less than zero. We had a contraction. That's what a recession is. We've got in here two and three quarters percent growth uh, on average for the year, which is a respectable number by OECD standards. Slower than last year, 
but not much slower on the national accounts. Last year was 3-3. Three, three. This is two and three quarters. Uh, that will imply some slowing over the course of the year. But it won't mean a recession. It won't mean a recession. And the balance of payments today has no implication for growth in the economy. It only has an implication for demand conditions which obtained six or nine months ago when imports were ordered then. And today's balance of payments is well within, well within the current account forecast which we published in the budget last night. Exports, in today's, in today's, uh, in today's number, exports were up 6 per cent seasonally adjusted. They've been, they've been up, they've been growing by 7 per cent on average for the last five years, the highest rate of growth for the last 25 years. The highest rate of growth for the last 25 years. In other words, we've accomplished the fundamental restructuring of the economy that evaded you for so long. And I gave the figures last night, I'll, gave, I'll give them again. In the five years to 1988, 1989, we've had a, a rate of average rate of investment growth of 10.8 per cent. In your Order. previous five years, it was 1.6. 1.6. In other words, our growth rate in investment has been seven times stronger. And in the five years before that, the five years to 1978, it was 2.3. 2.3. And if you extract from that the investment boom which came by virtue of the fact the Japanese wanted Australian coal to offset their Middle East oil imports, which had nothing to do with Australian domestic economic policy, you abstract that investment phase in the mining sector and your investment record in the 10 years to when we took office was zero, against 10.8 per cent a year on average. So the fundamental restructuring, which has eluded the economy for a decade, which has eluded the Australian economy for 15 years, we've succeeded in the last five years. And why is it there? Because of a pickup in the profit share, because of a massive shift in the factor shares from wages to profits, because of a dramatic shift in public saving of a reduction of eight percentage points in the public sector borrowing requirement, making the private sector of the economy so much more bigger and so much more robust, with a reduction in company tax is it any wonder we've got an investment surge of this, of this order of dimension on? And that's what will maintain growth through the coming year. Because as domestic demand falls off, it will be net exports which will carry the economy as we shift our production into the external sector, to exports and to import replacement. And if you look in the budget forecast, if the shadow treasurer wants to look in the budget forecast, he'll find that exports are growing on average 7 per cent through the year. Meaning, over the course of the year, later on in the year, they'll be growing faster than seven. And it is that export growth which will hold up GDP and avoid a recession. So the whole premise of his question is wrong. To have a recession, you've got to get on under zero. To have the economy contract, and I'm afraid only he and his colleagues, the member for Bandalong and Senator Stone, were the only people around Order. this country who were clever enough to do that. The Honourable Member for Perth. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Speaker. My question is directed to the Minister for Primary Industry and Energy. In view of the fact that very significant technological advancement has occurred in the area of solar and wind generation, making these renewable sources of energy increasingly attractive and attainable, can the Minister inform the House what progress is being made to encourage the development of such renewable energy resources and uh, indeed to reward conservation, particularly given the fact that many state energy authorities may be hooked on their own agendas, which uh, are based on increased consumption and traditional energy sources. The Honourable Minister for Primary Industry and Energy. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. Um, the government su supports, um, provides support for the development of renewable energy and energy um, efficient technologies through the National Energy Research Development and Demonstration Program. Now, since that program commenced in 1978, some $62 million has been committed to projects in these areas. And some examples would include, in the member's own state, a wind farm demonstration at uh, Esperance in cooperation with the State Energy Commission of Western Australia, development of improved domestic solar water heaters, uh, development of high efficiency photovoltaic cells and systems for remote area application. Uh, the government's commitment to this area was further demonstrated by the announcement in December 87 that an additional $5 million would be made over five years for research into renewable energy energy efficiency and energy conservation. Uh, we also provide support for programs to encourage energy conservation. 
Over the past decade, some $7 million has been committed to these programs, much of that in close cooperation with the states. And also in recognition of the importance of conservation, the government has announced a doubling of its commitment to programs in this area uh, to $1 million in 1989-90 and a further increase to one4 in 1991. Uh, just picking up the last point of the Honourable Member's question, um, there have been a number of claims of deficiencies in state electricity policies, and members, I think, would be aware that the Treasurer last night announced a proposed inquiry into the efficiency of resource use and in electricity generation and distribution to be conducted by the new Industry Commission. And, of course, state governments will be consulted before proceeding with the inquiry. The Honourable Member for Chisholm. Uh, for, sorry, for Lowe. <laughs> Thank you, Madam Speaker. My question is addressed to the Minister for Community Services and Health. Is the Minister aware that up to 400 Australian families are suffering both socially and financially as a result of uh, haemophiliac family members being treated with blood products containing the HIV infection? And is the Minister also aware that the British Government has made available to the British Haemophilia Society a £10 million trust fund to assist 1,200 families in a similar situation? And can the Minister tell the House how much of the AIDS funding and allocated in the budget will be used to help the families of Australian haemophiliacs infected with HIV? The Honourable Minister for Community Services. I thank the Honourable Member for Lowe for his question. And I am aware of the uh, number of haemophiliacs uh, affected uh, by AIDS in this country and the uh, problems that causes. But let me say, first of all, that of course uh, those people have access to the full range of services that we are seeking to provide in responding to this disease in this country. There have been claims that the government has not acted on calls for compensation, first of all, by people infected with HIV through the supply of blood or blood products in this country. In fact, the issue has been the subject of continued consideration since this route of infection was first recognised and the blood supply protected, not just by this government, but let me say by all the governments in this country. In February 1985, the Australian Health Services Council established a working party which recommended against a compensation scheme on the grounds that there were no precedents for disease compensation. People with AIDS were already entitled to normal welfare arrangements, and such a scheme would not affect the legal liability for claims for negligence and that it would be a scheme complex to administer. That was the consideration in 1985. Now, these recommendations were noted by all the Australian health ministers at their conference in May 1985 and have formed the basis to date of the government's response. Compensation was again examined by NACAID's working group in 1986, and a proposal for compensation payment was considered by an interdepartmental committee at the Commonwealth level on AIDS in July 1987 and was not supported. The issue has also been the subject of a number of discussions between the Haemophilia Foundation of Australia and the Minister and Departmental Representatives. The Haemophilia Foundation lodged a submission with the Commonwealth Government in March 1989 to set out its grounds for special government assistance. This has been examined in the context of the Government's national HIV AIDS strategy, which is set out in the forthcoming White Paper. What I've got to say is that there is no other comparable scheme for other medically acquired conditions in this country. So, all of us in this House should be aware that if we move in this direction, we will be setting a precedent which affects no other medically acquired condition as yet in this country. We've sought legal advice on whether people infected through the blood supply retain their right to seek compensation for negligence through the legal system. And people do retain the common law right to pursue claims for negligence. Though we all recognise, we all recognise, the difficulty lies in being able to prove negligence before HIV was known to be transmissible through the blood supply and the blood supply was secured. The universal coverage of medical and hospital needs under Medicare and the existing framework of income maintenance benefits provides support in this country for all el eligible people. And the basic criterion for any government assistance is the need of the claimant rather than the cause of the illness. Now, I believe the government's position, position has remained consistent over a number of years, but we are nevertheless paying close and continuous attention to what is perhaps one of the most difficult issues in the whole AIDS area. The Honourable Member for Dobell. Yeah. Madam Speaker, my question without notice is addressed to the Minister for Transport and Communications. Is the Minister aware of reports that the ABC has been underfunded by $28 million in, has been underfunded by $28 million in last night's budget. 
and that as a result it will be forced to reduce broadcast hours and defer some expenditures, including an extension of the second ABC radio network and two Triple J. Can the Minister advise the House if this is correct? Good question. Good the Honourable question. Minister for Very Communications. Uh, Madam Speaker, I have seen reports of the kind mentioned by the member for Dobell, in which uh, the Chairman and the General Manager of the ABC have uh, been claiming that uh, <coughs> through that under alleged underfunding that they would need to cut TV transmission time, uh, reduce TV program purchases, uh, reduce expenditure on the second regional radio network extension and uh, also reduce ex expenditure on the proposed extension of the Triple J Youth Network. And let me say, Madam Speaker, that the government does not accept in any way that the ABC has been underfunded. Now, the facts of the matter are firstly that the government decided last year that the ABC should be appropriated $450 million for the year 88-9, and that that amount should be cash limited, that, that is that it would not be supplemented for unforeseen cost increases. And that advice was given to the ABC on a number of occasions. Now, the government also decided that ABC funding should be maintained in real terms for the next two years, but be subject to the efficiency dividend in the same way as all government departments and most budget-funded agencies are required uh, to do. Now, because inflation in 88-9 was uh, above the budget estimates, the ABC claimed that funding for that year should be increased by $30 million and that uh, that enhanced figure should become the base to which uh, the price index uh, should be applied for this year to get uh, maintenance in real terms. Now, the government rejected that claim uh, because uh, it was not in accord with its earlier decision to provide the ABC with a cash limited appropriation of $450 million for 88.9, as it advised the ABC on several occasions. In the context of this year's budget, the government reconfirmed its decision to maintain last year's appropriation in real terms. This year's budget allocation of $473.6 million is an increase of 5.2% which represents real terms maintenance minus the efficiency dividend. So there is no breach of commitment by the government in any way on the decision that was made last year and conveyed to the ABC. We totally reject the ABC's claim that they've been robbed in any who underfunded of, of, by $28 million. Now let me also say, Madam Speaker, that that's not the end of the story. The total resources available to the ABC are more than uh, that which comes from the budget appropriations. The ABC has uh, substantial receipts from other sources, uh, its orchestral activities, uh, its bookshops and other activities. Last year those receipts were $54 million. This year the ABC's estimate for those, uh, for those receipts is $65.5 million. Now the ABC keeps all of these receipts, these are cash receipts, the ABC keeps all of these receipts, they're not in any way taken from them by the government. Uh, furthermore, the ABC has cash balances. At the beginning of uh, last uh, financial year, its cash balances was minus two and a half million dollars. Uh, through the last year, they managed to improve on that situation instead of having a positive cash balance at the beginning of this year of five and a half million dollars. In other words, a turnaround of eight million dollars. So total resources available to the ABC in 89-90 this year are $544.6 million, that is 8.6 per cent above last year. Uh, and that, of course, uh, has to be compared with the budget forecast for the non-farm GDP deflator of six and a quarter per cent, so a substantial real increase in resources to the ABC. I should also mention that uh, the resources review, which the ABC has uh, committed itself to undertake, is supposed to uh, reduce staff by 15 per cent over a few years, and that uh, and that that, uh, and that, that uh, staff uh, reduction should be producing salary savings of $24 million in this financial year. So, Madam Speaker, I think that it can be seen that the ABC resources for 88.9 should be seen as being sufficient at least to provide uh, for the same level of activity this year as last year. I think on any uh, objective analysis, the ABC is being fairly, indeed generously treated and we reject absolutely the charge that there has been some underfunding of the ABC. The ABC should stop whinging and get on with the job. Yeah. The Honourable Member for Wentworth. My question is to the Treasurer. Is it a fact that it was necessary to add a massive $1.7 billion to the Ford estimates for, uh, for 89.90 to derive the budget outlays estimate to allow for parameter changes including the substantial underestimate of the impact of inflation? 
Does this confirm that those forward estimates were a totally unreliable guide for future trends in Commonwealth spending? The Honourable Treasurer. Yes. Yes. Speaker, uh, my colleague, uh, the Minister of Defence, said they never gave us any forward estimates when they were around, and that's dead right. When we came to office, there were no forward estimates. You had the government that are available only to the government. Now we publish forward estimates for three years out with the budget. And not only that, the documentation in the budget is now about twice as much as it was in terms of information provided to the parliament and the public than it was in 1983-4. And that's why it is such a mockery and a slur on the bureaucracy of this country to be talking about audits, audits, to be talking about audits. I remind the member for O'Connor of Standing Order 55. When we talk about audits, when you've got forward estimates published by the Finance Department now, each year for three years out, and what you're saying by implication is that somehow those numbers are tricked up, that they are not an accurate reflection of the Commonwealth's programs or its outlays. This can be the only implication from these claims that you should or need an audit if you were to come to office. Now, you treated the Finance Department like dirt when you were in office. If something was a negative, was a receipt, you made it a negative outlay. You cheated on all the OECD classifications. You made those you people, cheat, you made those people shift it. No, we've given the finance department status, real status, real status. So what you see is what you get in forward estimates. They actually mean something. They actually mean something. The sort of the kind of public accountability there should have always been, but now to hide behind the fact that you're not prepared to declare your policies, with the leader of the National Party having the audacity to say that he will announce them in an election campaign, the kind of cynicism he would have learned from Jack McEwen and Anthony and Nixon and all the other country party thugs we saw in this parliament for years. What you'll show us now is you'll show us the colour of your policies in the election campaign. Well, brother, I think you're in for a rude shock. Just the same as your colleagues in the Liberal Party would be if they were to fall for that. But the fact is the forward estimates do mean something. And in here there is a reconciliation table which reconciles every adjustment of the, uh, of the outlays from the forward estimates through the April statement through the budget to now. And what it shows is in terms of the main changes, that is, there were decisions taken since April adding $223 million to outlays but negative in the out years, I might say, 1,621 million of new policy, less 1,399 million of savings. And the result is that, uh, that of course, we're seeing another negative outlays year. Now, that's the kind of accounts you should have always had. And there was no cause why you couldn't have revealed them and made the public better informed, commentators better informed about the nature of the public debate. <coughs> but because you're always cheating on policy, you cheated on the documents as well. The Honourable Prime Minister. Ask the, further be placed in the, notice paper. the Honourable Leader of the House. Madam Speaker, a paper is tabled as listed on the schedule circulated to honourable members earlier today. Details of the paper will be recorded in the votes and proceedings.